afternoon, class. Uh, today we're going to uh, go over Unit 5, Chapter 23, Part B, the digestive system. So in Section 23.5, we're going to go over the anatomy and functions of the pharynx and the esophagus. The pharynx, uh, food passes from the mouth into the oropharynx and then into the laryngopharynx. And remember, the pharynx serves as a common passageway for solid food, liquids, and air. Um, and remember also, this is something uh, we mentioned in the lab, uh, we described the epithelial lining and the visions of the pharynx. Um, so uh, it's a stratified squamous epithelium lining with mucus producing glands. And there's also an external muscle layers that consists of two skeletal muscle layers. Uh, the inner layer of muscles will runs longitudinally and the outer pharyngeal constrictors encircle the wall of the pharynx. The esophagus is a hollow muscular tube with a length of approximately 25 centimeters or one foot and a diameter of about two centimeters uh, or 0.75 inches at its widest point. The primary function of the esophagus is to carry solid food and liquids to the stomach. Uh, and it's, so it's a flat tube uh, and it's collapsed when not involved in food propulsion. It pierces the diaphragm at the esophageal hiatus and joins the stomach at the cardiac orifice. The gastroesophageal or cardiac sphincter surrounds the cardial orifice and it keeps that orifice closed when food is not being swallowed. And mucus cells on both sides of the sphincter help protect the esophagus from acid reflux that comes from the, uh, from the uh, stomach. So in terms of the histology of the esophagus, it has all four alimentary canal layers. The esophageal mucosa is made up of stratified squamous epithelium, and it's a non-keratinized uh, layer that is similar to that of the pharynx and the oral cavity. The esophageal glands in the submucosa secrete mucus to help in bolus uh, movement. Uh, and so these, there are folds uh, that are present there. There's large folds uh, and they allow for expansion during the passage of a large bolus, except when you swallow. And muscle tone in the walls keeps the lumen closed. Then there's a muscularis uh, externa, which is a skeletal muscle superiorly mixed in the middle and smooth muscle inferiorly. And then finally, there's an uh, adventitia instead of a serosa. So no serosa, but an adventitia of connective tissue outside the muscularis externa that anchors the esophagus in position against the dorsal body wall. Over the one to two centimeters between the diaphragm and the, esoph and the stomach, sorry, the esophagus is retroperitoneal with peritoneum covering the anterior and left lateral surfaces. Number 2313A, microscopic structure of the esophagus. If we start from the lumen, uh, there's the mucosa layer, which is a stratified squamous epithelium. Then there's the submucosa, which is areolar connective tissue. Then there's the muscularis externa, which is made up of circular and longitudinal muscle layer, and the adventitia, which is a fibrous connective tissue layer on the outside. In figure 2313b, um, again, microscopic structure of the esophagus. Uh, this here is at the esophagus stomach junction. Uh, you can see the mucosa, which is a stratified squamous epithelium. I hope you can recognize that. And then we see the simple columnar epithelium of the stomach. Clinical homeostatic imbalance 23.6, heartburn, which is caused by the stomach acid that is regurgitated into the esophagus, the lower section of the esophagus. Uh, the first symptom of gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. Um, it can be caused by excess food or drink, extreme obesity. Sometimes it's pretty common in um, it's pretty common in pregnancy and running. It also can be caused by uh, hiatal hernia. 
uh, structural abnormality where part of the stomach protrudes above the diaphragm. We've already discussed this uh, before. Uh, it can lead to esophagitis, esophageal ulcers, or, or even esophageal cancer. The, uh, digestive processes of the mouth. So the pharynx and esophagus are conduits to pass food from the mouth to the stomach. Uh, the major function of both organs is propulsion that starts with deglutition or swallowing. Uh, deglutition involves coordination of 22 muscle groups and two phases. The buccal phase is a voluntary contraction of the tongue and the pharyngeal esophageal phase uh, which is an involuntary phase that primarily involves the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is this nerve that uh, innervates uh, many organs, many viscera in the body, um, which we're going to see uh, next semester when we do the autonomic nervous system. And uh, this phase is controlled by the swallowing center in the medulla uh, and the lower pons of, of the brain. So let's examine the um, steps invo involved in swallowing. So this is figure 23.14, and we're going to look at uh, it, the process in steps. In step one, the buccal phase, the upper esophageal sphincter is contracted or closed. The tongue forces against the hard palate, forcing the food bolus into the oropharynx. In the second phase, the pharyngeal esophageal phase. It begins when the tongue blocks the mouth, the soft palate and its ovula rise, closing off the nasopharynx. The larynx rises so that the epiglottis blocks the trachea, so no food goes into the trachea, and the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, and then the food will enter the esophagus. In step three, this is uh, the pharyngeal esophageal phase continues. Uh, so steps three to five, the constrictor muscles of the pharynx contract, forcing food into the esophagus inferiorly. The upper esophageal sphincter contracts after food enters. In step four, peristalsis moves food through the esophagus to the stomach. So basically, peristalsis involves the contraction of circular muscles and longitudinal muscles. In step five, the gastroesophageal sphincter surrounding the cardiac orifice opens. After food enters the stomach, the sphincter closes, preventing regurg regurgitation of food. For a typical bolus, the entire trip takes about nine seconds to complete. Liquids may make the journey in a few seconds, arriving ahead of the peristaltic contractions with the assistance of gravity. A dry or poorly lubricated bolus travels much more slowly. Um, uh, so you cannot swallow a completely dry bolus because friction with the walls of the esophagus will make peristalsis ineffective. So for this reason, it is almost impossible to swallow an entire slice of processed white bread without taking a drink. Section 23.6, the stomach. So we're going to describe the anatomy of the stomach, its histological features, and its roles in digestion and absorption. The stomach performs four major functions. One, the bulk storage of ingested food. Two, the mechanical breakdown of ingested food. Three, the disruption of chemical bonds in food material through the action of acids and enzymes. And four, the production of intrinsic factor, which is a glycoprotein whose presence in the digestive tract is required for the absorption of vitamin B12 in the small intestine. Uh, so the stomach is a temporary storage tank that starts chemical breakdown of protein digestion. It convert, converts the bolus of food to a paste-like uh, chyme. Uh, an empty stomach has about 50 mils of volume, but it can expand to 4 liters. And when empty, the stomach mucosa forms many folds called rugae. Major regions of the stomach are the cardiac portion or part, uh, which surrounds the cardial orifice. The fundus is that dome-shaped region beneath the diaphragm. The body is the mid-portion. And the pyloric part is that wider and more superior portion of pyloric region. The antrum narrows into a pyloric canal that terminates in the pylorus. Pylorus is continuous with the duodenum. 
through a pyloric valve, uh, which is the sphincter controlling stomach emptying, because the stomach is not going to empty all at once. Figure 2315A, the anatomy of the stomach. Uh, let's locate the cardia. Uh, so the cardia is the smallest part of the stomach. Uh, it contains abundant mucous glands whose secretions coat the connection with the esophagus and help protect the, that tube from the acids and enzymes of, uh, of the stomach. Then we have the fundus. Uh, so locate the fundus is the portion of the stomach that is superior to the junction between the stomach and the esophagus. Uh, the fundus can uh, contacts the inferior posterior surface of the diaphragm. Then there's the body. It's the area between the fundus and the curve of the J is the body of the stomach. Uh, so the body is the largest region of the stomach and it functions as a mixing tank for ingested food and secretions produced in the stomach. There are gastric glands uh, in the fundus and body secrete most of the acids and enzymes involved in gastric digestion. Uh, then we have the pylorus, which is uh, the curve of the J. Uh, the pylorus is divided into a pyloric and anthrum uh, or cavity, which is connected to the body, and a pyloric canal, which empties into the duodenum, the proximal segment of the small intestine. Uh, as mixing movements occur during digestion, the pylorus frequently changes shape. Uh, then we mentioned the pyloric sphincter or valve at the pylorus uh, regulates the release of chyme into the duodenum. Glands in the pylorus secrete mucus and important digestive hormones, including gastrin, which is a hormone that stimulates the activity of gastric glands. In figure 2315a, also make a note of the lesser curvature and the greater curvature, which we're going to talk about soon. Greater curvature is that convex lateral surface of the stomach, whereas the lesser curvature is the concave medial aspect of the stomach. Mesenteries extend from the curvatures and tether the stomach to other digestive organs. Uh, for example, example, the lesser omentum runs from the lesser curvature to the liver. The greater omentum drapes inferiorly from the greater curvature over the intestine, the spleen, and the transverse colon. It blends with the mesocolon, mesentery that anchors the large intestine to the abdominal wall, contains fat deposits and lymph nodes. The autonomic nervous system supplies the stomach. Sympathetic fibers uh, from the thoracic splanchnic nerves are relayed through the celiac plexus, whereas the parasympathetic fibers are supplied by the vagus nerve. Uh, so if you remember, I've mentioned it uh, previously, sympathetic fibers, these here would inhibit uh, digestion, whereas parasympathetic fibers uh, will uh, activate uh, digestion. Uh, in terms of blood supply, the celiac trunk has both gastric and splenic branches, and there's also veins of the hepatic portal system. In terms of the histology of the stomach, uh, a simple columnar epithelium lines all portions of the uh, stomach. Uh, the stomach wall contains regular, the regular four tunics. However, the muscularis and mucosa are modified. The muscularis externa has circular and longitudinal smooth muscle layers, as well as extra third layer, the oblique or diagonal layer, which helps in churning. So together, the smooth muscles allow stomach, the stomach not only to churn, mix, and move ch uh, chyme, but also to pummel it, which increases physical breakdown and ram it into the small intestine. The mucosa layer is also modified. So it consists, as I said, of a simple columnar epithelium entirely composed of mucus cells. They secrete a two-layer coat of alkaline mucus so that it doesn't chew itself up. And the surface layer traps bicarbonate-rich fluid layer that is beneath it. Dotted, it's dotted with gastric pits, which lead into gastric glands, um, and uh, which, which are de uh, extend deep into the underlying lamina pro propria. 
and the gastric glands produce gastric uh, juice. Or 2316a microscopic anatomy of the stomach so if you look at the mucosa uh, the surface epithelium is made up of the uh, the simple columnar epithelium uh, then there's a lamina propria and the muscularis mucosae uh, then there's a submucosa and then there's the muscularis externa uh, which is made up of three layers of muscle the oblique circular and longitudinal muscle layer and then there's a serosa layer. The types of gland cells. Uh, so the glands in the fundus and body produce most gastric juice. Uh, the glands include secretory cells from the mucous neck cells, parietal cells, chief cells, and enteroendocrine cells. So together they secrete about 1,500 mils of gastric juice each day. Figure 2316b. Uh, the microscopic anatomy of the stomach. So locate the mucous cells in the surface epithelium. Uh, so uh, notice the gastric pit, uh, mucous neck cells, the parietal cells, the chief cells, and gastric gland, and the en enteroendocrine cell. So the mucous neck cells secrete a thin acidic mucus of unknown function. The parietal cells uh, have several secretions. Uh, hydrochloric acid, where the pH is really low, it's between 1.5 to 3.5, very acidic. Uh, these will denature the protein and activate pepsin, which is the enzyme that, uh, that is responsible for the breakdown of proteins. Uh, it can also break down plant cell walls and kills many bacteria. Most bacteria are killed by the hydrochloric acid. Uh, and then the other secretion from the parietal cells are intrinsic factor. This is a glycoprotein required for the absorption of vitamin B12 in the small intestine. And uh, just a note, the vitamin B12 is a vitamin that is essential for normal uh, erythropoiesis, which is the uh, making of blood. Chief cells are most abundant near the base of a gastric gland. These cells secrete pepsinogen, uh, which is uh, inactive, and then it's converted by the acid in the gastric lumen to pepsin. Um, pepsin functions most effectively at a strongly acidic pH. Um, so, and pepsin itself is going to activate um, pepsinogen. So this is part of a positive feedback mechanism. Chief cells also uh, will uh, produce lipases, which digest about 15% of lipids or fats. And interestingly, uh, the stomachs of newborn infants, but not of adults, produce renin, also known as chymosin. Uh, these enzymes are important for the digestion of milk. Uh, so together with the, lipase, with the lipases, uh, renin will coagulate the milk proteins, whereas the gastric lipase initiates the digestion of milk fats. Finally, the enteroendocrine cells secrete chemical messengers into the lamina propria. They act as paracrines, which are locally acting hormones uh, or messengers, uh, and they're known as serotonin and histamine. And they also secrete hormones uh, such as somatostatin, which also acts as a paracrine, and the hormone gastrin. Gastrin stimulates secretion by both parietal and chief cells, as well as contractions of the gastric wall that mix and stir the gastric contents. Uh, whereas somatostatin uh, is a hormone that inhibits the release of gastrin. 2316 summarizes, uh, really summarizes the, uh, the function of these cells. So the parietal cell secretes hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factors. So hydrochloric acid is needed for the conversion of pepsinogen or the actually the activation of pepsinogen into, uh, into uh, pepsin. And pepsin itself is going to activate uh, pepsinogen uh, in a positive feedback mechanism. The chief cell secretes pepsinogen and the enteroendocrine cell, uh, as the name suggests, enteroendocrine secretes hormones and paracrines. 
the mucosal barrier. So this consists of, uh, because the, um, the uh, digestive conditions are harsh, it requires the stomach to be protected. So there's a mucosal barrier that protects the stomach and is created by three factors. The first one is a thick layer of bicarbonate-rich mucus. The second is the tight junctions between the epithelial cells, which prevents the juice seeping uh, underneath the tissue. And thirdly, damaged epithelial cells are quickly replaced by the vision of stem cells. And surface cells are replaced every three to six days. This high rate of cell division explains why radiation and anti-cancer drugs that inhibit mitosis have drastic effects on the digestive tract. Lost epithelial cells are no longer replaced, and the cumulative damage to the epithelial lining quickly leads to problems in absorbing nutrients. Clinical homeostatic imbalance 23.7. A superficial inflammation of the gastric mucosa is called gastritis. The condition can develop after a person has swallowed drugs, including alcohol and aspirin. Gastritis can also appear after severe emotional or physical stress, bacterial infection of the gastric wall, or the ingestion of strongly acidic or alkaline chemicals. Uh, peptic or gastric ulcers. Uh, these can cause erosions in the stomach wall, um, and um, so it develops when the digestive acids and enzymes manage to erode their way through the defenses of the stomach lining or the proximal portions of the small intestine. Um, so uh, there's uh, peptic ulcers or gastric ulcers, uh, pretty much depends on the location. Uh, so peptic ulcers result from the excessive production of acid or the inadequate production of the alkaline mucus that defends the epithelium uh, against that uh, acid. Uh, gastric mucosal infections involving the bacterium Helicobacter pylori are responsible for at least 80% of peptic ulcers. Hence, treatment for gastric ulcer ulcers commonly involves taking antibiotic drugs. Figure 2317 shows a gastric ulcer. Figure 2318 is a photomicrograph of Helicobacter pylori. It's the bacteria that are most commonly uh, involved in uh, gastric ulcers. So most bacteria, when uh, ingested, uh, the, you know, the stomach acid will neutralize them, will kill them, whereas uh, Helicobacter pylori has found a way to uh, neutralize the acidity of the HCL. In the stomach. Digestive processes in the stomach. So just to recap, processes carried out by the stomach are uh, the breakdown of food, uh, serves as a holding area for food, so uh, uh, storage area for food, delivers chyme to the small intestine, denatures proteins by the action of hydrochloric acid, and the pepsin carries out uh, the pepsin, which is the, uh, the protein that breaks down, um, sorry, the, the enzyme that breaks down proteins. It carries out enzymatic digestion of proteins. Uh, a milk protein uh, known as casein is broken down by renin in infants, and the result is a curdy substance. Also, lipid-soluble alcohol and aspirin are absorbed in the blood uh, at the level of the stomach. Uh, only stomach function essential to life is really the secretion of intrinsic factor for the production of B12, uh, for the, sorry, the absorption of B12. Uh, and B12 is needed for red blood cells to mature. Lack of intrinsic factor causes a type of, of anemia called pernicious anemia, and it's treated with B12 injections. Gastric mucosa secretes more than three liters of gastric juice per day, and um, it's controlled by the uh, neural mechanisms and hormonal mechanisms. For the neural mechanisms, the uh, autonomic nervous system will uh, uh, send impulses. So the parasympathetic nervous system through the vagus nerve stimulates increased secretion, whereas the sympathetic nervous system will stimulate uh, stimulates a decrease in secre uh, secretion. Uh, the action of the parasympathetic and, and, um, and sympathetic nervous systems are uh, antagonistic. They're uh, opposite. Uh, 
Uh, for hormonal mechanisms, gastrin stimulates HCL secretion by the stomach and gastrin antagonist hormones by the small intestine. Three phases of gastric control are identified, although considerable overlap exists among them. The cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal uh, phase. The cephalic phase of gastric secretion begins when you see, smell, taste, or think of uh, a food. Um, emotional states can exaggerate or inhibit the cephalic phase. For example, anger or, or, or hostility leads to excessive gastric secretion, whereas anxiety, stress, or fear decreases gastric secretion and gastric contractions or motility. The gastric phase lasts three to four uh, hours and provides two-thirds of gastric juice released. Uh, the stimulation of the gastric phase involves distension, uh, which activates the stretch receptors, initiating both long and short reflexes. Uh, chemical stimuli such as uh, partially digestive, uh, digested proteins, caffeine, and low acidity will activate the entero enteroendocrine G cells to secrete gastrin. The of gastrin then initiates hydrochloric acid release from the parietal cells and activates enzyme secretion, which prods parietal cells to secrete HCL by binding to receptors on the parietal cells, stimulating endo, uh, ento, enteroendocrine cells to release histamine. The buffering action of ingested proteins causes the pH to rise, which activates more gastrin secretion. Inhibition of gastric phase would be uh, so something like low pH would inhibit gastrin secretion, and it occurs between meals, uh, and it occurs during digestion as a negative feedback mechanism. The more protein, the more HCl acid is secreted, which causes a decline in pH, which inhibits gastrin secretion. The intestinal phase of gastric secretion begins when chyme starts to enter the small intestine. So first there's a brief stimulatory component and then it's followed by inhibition. So stimulation of intestinal phase is when partially digested food enters the small intestine, causing a brief release of intestinal or enteric gastrin. And it encourages gastric glands of the stomach to continue secretory activities and the stimulatory effect is brief and overridden by inhibitor inhibitory stimuli as the intestine fills. Inhibition of intestinal phase uh, includes um, distension of the duodenum due to entry of chyme, presence of acidic chyme, presence of fatty, fatty chyme, and presence of hypertonic chyme. Uh, the inhibitory effects protect the intestine from being overwhelmed by too much chyme or acidity, and the inhibition is achieved in two ways, enterogastric reflex and enterogastrones. In the enterogastric reflex, the duodenum inhibits the acid secretion in the stomach by enteric nervous system short reflexes and by the sympathetic nervous system and vagus nerve long reflexes. For the enterogastrones, the duodenal enteroendocrine cells release two important hormones that inhibit gastric secretion, secretin and cholecystokinin, or CCK. Your 2319 includes both neural and hormonal mechanisms that regulate the release of gastric juice. So we have it subdivided into, on the left, the cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. And then there are the uh, a summary of these stimulatory effects, events, sorry, and inhibitory events. So in the cephalic phase, remember it's sight and thought of food and stimulation of taste and smell receptors that uh, will, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, incoming sensory information goes to the cerebral uh, cortex, which sends uh, information to the hypothalamus and medulla oblongata. And then there's the vagus nerve that will uh, stimulate the, uh, the stomach. Uh, the gastric phase, we have the stomach distension that activates the stretch receptors. So there are long reflexes by the medulla and vagus nerve uh, that will stimulate the stomach and its ac secretory activity, and then short reflexes as well. Uh, food chemicals, especially peptides and caffeine, and rising pH activates chemoreceptors, um, which will activate G cells, and these will release gastrin to, to the blood 
and will uh, increase uh, uh, the uh, secretory activity in the stomach. And in the intestinal phase, presence of partially digested foods in the duodenum or the stension of the duodenum when the stomach begins to empty will um, cause the uh, release of uh, gastrin uh, to the blood uh, and has this brief uh, stimulatory effect on the stomach. In terms of inhibitory effects, loss of appetite, depression, for example, will signal the cerebral cortex, which will uh, decrease uh, parasympathetic activity. And so that has an inhibitory effect on the secretion uh, of the stomach. Uh, excessive acidity, uh, the pH greater than 2 in the stomach, and emo- uh, will... Uh, stimulate the G cells, and then gastrin uh, production will decrease. So not as much gastrin is released into the blood. Emotional stress will affect the sympathetic nervous system, which overrides the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember, the parasympathetic is the rest and digest, so it stimulates uh, digestion or secretion by the stomach, whereas sympathetic has that inhibitory effect. And uh, in 3B, the stension of the duodenum presence of fatty, acidic, or hypertonic chyme uh, will um, uh, have an enterogastric reflex, which involves both short and long reflexes, which will inhibit the secretion of the stomach and also uh, release of enterogastrones uh, like secretin and CCK, which will inhibit secretion by the stomach. Please please take a look at uh, table 23.1. Uh, at the hormones and paracrines that are involved in the act of uh, digestion. So it talks about CCK, um, uh, gastrin, histamine, intestinal gastrin, uh, secretin, uh, serotonin, somatostatin, and, uh, and others. Okay, so it's a pretty comprehensive um, summary of these, uh, the involvement of those hormones. In the second part of the figure, concentrate on secretin, serotonin, and somatostatin. Mechanism of HCL formation. So the parietal cells pump H plus from carbonic acid breakdown into the stomach lumen via a H plus, K plus, ATPase, which is a proton pump. So as the H plus is pumped into the stomach lumen, bicarbonate is exported back to the blood via Cl minus and bicarbonate antiporter. The result is an increase of bicarbonate in the blood, leaving the stomach, and this is referred to as the alkaline tide. The Cl minus is pumped out to the lumen to join with H plus forming HCl. Figure 2320, mechanism of HCL secretion by the parietal cells. Okay, so in step one, H plus and bicarbonate ions are generated from the dissociation of carbonic acid produced from CO2 and H2O by carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme responsible for for that dissociation. You're already very familiar with this uh, with this formula. It's uh, it's going to be on your test tomorrow. Uh, then in the second step, uh, if you follow with the arrows, the H plus, K plus ATPase pumps the H plus into the lumen and, uh, and the K plus into the cell. So it's a one per one, one, one exchange. The K plus returns to the lumen through membrane channels. In step three, the bicarbonate leaves the cell, this is called the alkaline tide, in exchange for interstitial fluid Cl minus. So again, one-to-one exchange, a negative for another negative. And then in step four, the Cl minus diffuses through the membrane channels into the lumen to join H plus to become HCl. Next section, regulation of gastric motility and emptying. So the response of the stomach to filling. Uh, So stretches to accommodate incoming food. Two factors cause pressure to remain constant until 1.5 liters of food is ingested. So there's receptive relaxation, which is a reflex-mediated relaxation of smooth muscle coordinated by swallowing the swallowing center of the brain stem. And the second is gastric accommodation, which is the intrinsic 
ability of the smooth muscle to exhibit a stress relaxation response, which enables the hollow organs to stretch without increasing tension or contractions. The gastric contractile activity. So peristaltic waves move toward the pylorus at a rate of three waves per minute. The basic electrical rhythm, or BER, is set by enteric pacemaker cells, formerly known as the interstitial, interstitial cells of Cajal. These pacemaker cells are linked by gap junctions to ensure that the entire muscularis contracts at the same time. Uh, the stension and gastrin increase the force of contraction. The contractions are most vigorous and powerful near the pylorus region of the stomach. Uh, 30 mils of chyme produced is either delivered in 3 mil spurts to the duodenum or rest of the 27 mils is forced backward into the stomach. Only liquids and small particles are allowed to pass through the pyloric valve. Here 2321 shows peristaltic waves in the stomach. So first is propulsion, second is grinding, and third is retropulsion. So in propulsion, peristaltic waves move from the fundus of the stomach toward the pylorus. In grinding, the most vigorous peristalsis and mixing action occur close to the pylorus. The pyloric end of the stomach acts as a pump that delivers small amounts of chyme into the duodenum. And third part, retropulsion, the peristaltic wave closes the pyloric valve, forcing most of the contents of the pylorus backward into the stomach. See the blue arrow Regulation of gastric emptying. The duodenum can prevent overfilling by controlling how much chyme enters. So there are duodenal receptors that respond to stretch and chemical signals to ensure that there's no overfilling, right? And the enterogastric reflex and enterogastrones inhibit gastric secretion and duodenal filling. We already talked about those. The stomach empties in about four hours, but increase in fatty chyme entering the duodenum can increase time to six hours or more, whereas carbohydrate-rich chyme moves quickly through the duodenum. 23.22, neural and hormonal factors that inhibit gastric emptying. So the presence of fatty, hypertonic, acidic chyme in the duodenum stimulates the duodenal enter enteroendocrine cells to secrete enterogastrones such as secretin and CCK, and it also stimulates chemoreceptors and stretch receptors that trigger the enterogastric reflex through short reflex uh, arcs via enteric, uh, enteric uh, neurons and long reflex via the central nervous system centers, which increase sympathetic activity and decrease parasympathetic activity. And these, the actions of all of these, will decrease the contractile force of the stomach and decrease the rate of stomach emptying as well. Uh, clinical homeostatic imbalance 23.8. So vomiting, vomiting is caused by extreme stretching uh, or intestinal irritants such as bacterial toxins, uh, excessive alcohol, really spicy food, and uh, certain drugs. Uh, chemicals and sensory impulses stimulate the em emetic center of the medulla, and uh, excessive vomiting can lead to dehydration and electrolyte and acid base imbalances through uh, alkalosis. Section 23.7, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas are accessory organs associated with the small intestine. So the liver, in terms of its digestive process, function it's it produces bile and bile is not a is not an enzyme it emulsifies fats the gallbladder its job is to store the bile and the pancreas is uh, supplies most of the enzymes needed to digest chyme as well as bicarbonate to neutralize the stomach acid Gross anatomy of the liver. So it's the largest gland in the body. It weighs about three pounds and it consists of four primary lobes, the right, the left, the caudate, and the quadrate. The falciform ligament separates the larger right and smaller left lobes and it suspends the liver from the diaphragm and anterior abdominal wall. Whereas the round ligament, also known as the ligamentum teres, is a remnant of fetal umbilical vein 
along the free edge of the falciform ligament. Figure 23.23a, the gross anatomy of the human liver. Okay, so notice the uh, right lobe of the liver, the uh, left lobe of the liver, and the falciform ligament, which, se which separates those two lobes. And then notice the uh, round ligament or ligamentum teres. And as we said, it is a remnant of the uh, fetal umbilical vein Notice the gallbladder just, uh, just below the, uh, the liver. Remember, it stores bile. 2323B, this is the, uh, the posterior or dorsal aspect of the, of the liver. The one before was the uh, uh, anterior aspect, uh, anterior or ventral. So now here, we can see the left lobe of the liver. Uh, we can see the caudate lobe, the right lobe of the liver, and the quadrate uh, lobe. Uh, and you can see the gallbladder really well uh, from, this, uh, from this view. The lesser omentum anchors the liver to the stomach. The hepatic artery and vein enter the liver at the porta hepatis. And the bile ducts, the common hepatic duct leaves the liver, whereas the cystic duct connects to the gallbladder, whereas the bile duct is formed by the uni union of the common hepatic duct and the cystic ducts. Figure 23.23c uh, shows, again, um, details. Uh, so notice the porta hepatis, which allows the passage of the hepatic portal vein that comes from the small intestine, the hepatic artery, and the common hepatic duct. Uh, so remember, the uh, common hepatic duct uh, joins the cystic duct to become the bile duct. In terms of the histological organization of the liver, so each lobe of the liver is divided by connective tissue into approximately about 100,000 liver uh, lobules, uh, which is the basic functional units of the liver. So these are hexagonal, hexagonal in shape and, um, and are composed of plates of hepatocytes or liver cells. Hepato is liver, cytes are cells that filter and process nutrient-rich blood. The central vein is located in the longitudinal axis. A portal triad in each corner of the lobule contains the branch of the hepatic artery, which supplies oxygen, a branch of the hepatic portal vein, which brings a nutrient-rich blood from the intestine, and the bile duct, which receives bile from the bile canaliculi. 23.24a, the mi microscopic anatomy of the liver. So notice the many lobules of the liver. Figure 23.24b, notice the uh, lobules that are all, uh, the, uh, lo we're showing one lobule and it's, uh, it's separated from the other lobules by the connective tissue septum. And at the center of the lobule is a central vein. Also, uh, associated with the liver are liver sinusoids. These are le leaky capillaries located between the hepatic plates. So blood from both the hepatic portal vein and the hepatic artery proper percolates from the triad regions through the sinusoids and empties into the central vein, which I showed you in the previous uh, image. Stellate macrophages or hepatic macrophages in the liver's uh, sinusoids will remove debris and old red blood cells. The 23.24c, again, the microscopic anatomy of the liver. This figure here has a lot of detail. So if you locate the central vein, uh, then you can find the uh, sinusoids that uh, percolate into it. Uh, notice the plates of the hepatocytes or liver cells. Then there's the bile canaliculi. Uh, then there's the portal triad, which consists of the bile duct, the branch of the portal vein, and the branch of the hepatic uh, artery. And uh, notice the bile duct, which receives bile from the bile canaliculi. So the hepatocytes or liver cells have uh, increased rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, peroxisomes, and mitochondria. And I may have mentioned it when we were learning these organelles. Just to remind you, the rough ER makes proteins, smooth ER makes, uh, uh, makes uh, lipids like phospholipids and, uh, and uh, steroids. Uh, Golgi apparatus will process all of these uh, 
uh, all of these products from the ER, peroxisomes contains enzymes that break down hydrogen peroxide and mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So very, very active uh, metabolic metabolically. Uh, so the hepatocyte functions produce uh, about 900 mils of bile per day. Uh, the process also process blood-borne nutrients. For example, they store glucose in the form of glycogen and also make plasma proteins. Uh, the hepatocytes also store fat-soluble vitamins and perform detoxification. For example, converting ammonia to urea. Ammonia is more toxic and urea is easily, uh, you can easily get rid of it at the level of the kidneys. Bile composition and enterohepatic circulation. So bile is yellow-green, and it's an alkaline solution that contains bile salts. Uh, these are uh, derivatives of cholesterol that function in fat emulsification and absorption. And the other component is bilirubin, which is a pigment from, formed from heme. So bacteria break uh, down in the intestine to stir stercobilin, and that's what gives the brown color of feces. Also, bile contains cholesterol, triglycerides, phospholipids, and electrolytes. What is enterohepatic circulation? It's a recycling mechanism that conserves bile salts. So the bile salts are reabsorbed into the blood by the ileum, which is the last part of the small intestine, and return to the liver via the hepatic portal blood. Uh, and then it's re-secreted in newly formed bile. So about 95% of secreted bile salts are recycled, so only 5% is newly synthesized each time. 23.25, the enterohepatic circulation. So in step one, bile salts are secreted into the duodenum, which is the first portion of the small intestine. In step two, as bile salts travel through the small intestine, they allow lipid digestion and absorption to occur. Three, 95% of the bile salts are reabsorbed by the ileum, which is the last portion of the small intestine. And in four, Reabsorbed bile salts travel via the hepatic portal vein back to the liver where they are recycled. So only 5% of bile salts are newly synthesized each time. Static imbalance of the liver. So um, hepatitis and cirrhosis. So hepatitis is usually caused by a viral infection. There's different types of uh, viral, you know, these uh, viral infections. Uh, hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, uh, which you'll learn about in microbiology. Also, uh, drug toxicity and wild mushroom poisoning. Uh, cirrhosis is, uh, is when it's characterized by the replacement of lobules by fibrous tissue. Um, and it's a progressive chronic inflammation from chronic hepatitis or alcoholism. Uh, so the liver liver becomes fatty and fibrous, and this is called, uh, and then it causes portal hypertension. So liver transplants are pretty successful, but but the problem is that livers are quite scarce, and also uh, the success rate is highest in young, otherwise healthy uh, individuals. And liver can regenerate to its full size in about six to twelve months after. 80% uh, removal. So it has really good regenerative, regenerative uh, properties. So clinical trials are now underway to test an artificial liver known as ELAD or extracorporeal liver assist device that may prove suitable for the long-term support of persons with a chronic liver disease. Next section is the gallbladder which is a hollow pear-shaped organ that stores and concentrates bile prior to its excretion into the small intestine. So it's a thin-walled muscular sac on the ventral aspect of the liver. So we said it absorb it functions to store and concentrate bile by absorbing water and ions. It contains many honeycomb folds that allow it to expand as it fills, and muscular contractions will release bile via the cystic duct, which flows into the bile duct. Clinical homeostatic imbalance, 23.9. So gallstones or biliary calculi are caused by too much cholesterol or too few bile salts. And they can obstruct the flow of bile from the gallbladder. Uh, and it can be very painful when the gallbladder contracts against sharp uh, crystals. Uh, so um, 
you know, as long as they're small, it's not a huge problem. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's when uh, they become too large uh, that it uh, can be uh, problematic. So obstructive jaundice is when the blockage can cause the bile salts and pigments to build up in the blood, resulting in jaundice or yellow skin. And jaundice can also be caused by liver failure. We mentioned this in the lab when we looked at the integumentary system. So in terms of gallstone treatment, there's uh, crystal dissolving drugs, uh, also ultrasound vibrations or lithotripsy, uh, laser vaporization or surgery. Now on to the pancreas. So location mostly retroperitoneal, deep to the greater curvature of the stomach. The head is encircled by the duodenum, whereas the tail abuts the spleen. Uh, in terms of the, uh, it's got an exocrine function and an endocrine function. So the exocrine function produces pancreatic juice. Uh, so the acini, uh, these are clusters of secretory cells that produce zymogen granules containing proenzymes. And the ducts will secrete uh, the, these uh, juices to the duodenum via the main pancreatic duct. And the smaller duct cells produce water and bicarbonate. In terms of the endocrine function, it will secrete insulin and glucagon by the pancreatic islet cells. Figure 23.26a, the structure of the enzyme-producing tissue of the pancreas. So the acinar cells, these are responsible for secreting enzymes. Uh, so here we can see in the picture uh, the zymogen granules uh, in the acinar cells, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, um, which, of course, produces uh, proteins and enzymes are proteins, uh, basement membrane all around. Uh, so this is one acinus, uh, and the duct cell uh, secretes bicarbonate and water, and there's a small duct close by. Figure 23.26b, structure of the enzyme-producing tissue of the pancreas. So the pancreas is, consists mostly of acinar cells, which are shown in this picture. So this is a histological uh, image of the uh, pancreas. Uh, there's also the pancreatic islets that produce insulin and glucagon, but they're not shown in this figure. We are going to look at these in uh, anatomy and physiology too when we do endocrinology. Composition of pancreatic juice. So 1,200 to 1,500 mils per day is produced, and it contains a watery alkaline solution around pH 8 that neutralizes the acidic chyme coming from the stomach. Uh, also produces electrolytes, primarily bicarbonate digest and digestive enzymes, such as proteases for protein digestion, which is secreted in an inactive form to prevent self-digestion, amylase for carbohydrate digestion, lipases for lipid breakdown and nucleases for the breakdown of nucleic acids. Um, so the proteases are secreted in an inactive form and then they are activated after they reach the duodenum. Enteropeptidase is the enzyme that's bound to the plasma membrane of the duodenal epithelial cells and it activates pancreatic protease trypsinogen to trypsin. Once trypsin is activated, it can then activate more trypsinogen like in a positive feedback mechanism that we saw in uh, the stomach with pepsin, and procarboxypeptidase to activate carboxypeptidase, and chymotrypsinogen to activate chymotrypsin. Figure 23.27, activation of pancreatic proteases in the small intestine. So there's the pancreas, there's the stomach, and there's the epithelial uh, cells. Of the small intestine. So membrane-bound enteropeptidase uh, will activate trypsinogen into trypsin, and more trypsin is going to activate trypsinogen, uh, chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin, and pro-carboxypeptidase into carboxypeptidase. Bile and pancreatic secretion into the small intestine. So the bile duct and pancreatic duct unite in the wall of the duodenum. They fuse together in a, in a bulb-like structure called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. The ampulla opens into the duodenum via volcano-shaped major duodenal papilla. Hepatopancreatic sphincter controls the entry of bile and pancreatic juice into the duodenum. 
and accessory pancreatic duct is a smaller duct that empties directly into the duodenum. 23.28, relationship of the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas to the duodenum. So find the large liver, uh, locate the gallbladder, the duodenum, and the pancreas. Um, so the um, find the right and left hepatic ducts, the common hepatic duct, as well as the cystic duct. And you see once the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct unite, it will form the bile duct. Uh, locate the sphincter, if you follow it down, to the pancreas. Um, so, uh, and then the major duodenal papilla in the duodenum. Uh, locate uh, the tail of pancreas, main pancreatic duct and sphincter, and the head of the pancreas. And find the hepatopancreatic ampulla and sphincter. Bile and pancreatic juice secretions are both stimulated by neural and hormonal controls. Hormonal controls include cholecystokinin and secretin. Bile secretion is increased when enterohepatic circulation returns large amounts of bile salts. Secretin from the intestinal cells exposed to HCL and fatty chyme stimulates the gallbladder to release the bile. And the hepatopancreatic sphincter is closed unless the digestion is active. So bile is stored in the gallbladder and released to small intestine only with contraction. Figure 23.29, mechanisms promoting secretion and release of bile in pancreatic juice. So uh, in one, the CCK and secretin are secreted by the duodenal and the enteroendocrine cells. So CCK release is stimulated by proteins and fats present in the chyme. Secretin release is stimulated by an acidic uh, chyme. And CCK and secretin enter the circulation and cause the following four events. So in event two, uh, pancreatic secretion, CCK induces secretion by the acinar cells of the enzyme-rich pancreatic juice. Secretin causes secretion by the duct cells of bicarbonate-rich pancreatic juice. And the vagus nerve weakly stimulates during the cephalic and gastric phases. In, um, in the third event, uh, bile secretion by the liver Bile salts returning from the enterohepatic circulation are the most powerful stimulus for bile secretion. Secretin is a minor stimulus, in fact. The gallbladder contraction uh, in 4. CCK causes the gallbladder contraction. The vagus nerve stimulates weak gallbladder contraction during the cephalic and gastric phases. And in 5. Hepatopancreatic sphincter relaxation. CCK causes the hepatopancreatic sphincter to relax. The bile and pancreatic juice will enter the duodenum.